God is good. Amen. Amen. I haven't said that in a while, so I thought I'd get started this way this morning. I dreamt of being at Center Ice in Maple Leaf Gardens <laughs> when I used to cheer for the Montreal Canadiens, Bishop Christian. <laughs> but I had a conversion. Now I'm cheering the Senators. Of course, it was easier because the year that I came to Ottawa, they were making a run for the Stanley Cup and lost in the final. That's more than we can say about the Maple Leafs lately. <laughs> Enough about hockey. <laughs> Seven years ago, as Father Frank mentioned, I was thrilled when Steubenville Atlantic started up in Nova Scotia. I want to congratulate Cardinal Collins and his team here in the Archdiocese of Toronto for the wonderful job they've done in establishing Steubenville Toronto. Haven't they done a good job? <laughs> it's a blessing that graces not only the Church of Toronto, but the neighboring dioceses too, London and Hamilton, Peterborough, Kingston, Alexandra, Cornwall, Pembroke and Ottawa and perhaps others as well who are following us online or in some other form. What a great gift this is. The prophet Amos, in the first reading today, speaks of an overflowing abundance of blessings that God constantly desires to pour out upon his people, particularly the rich blessings of a weekend such as this. It's a joy for me to preside at this Mass in honor of Our Lady on the first Saturday of the month of July con celebrating with the bishops who are here and the priests who are here with us in great number. The church from earliest days has had a special devotion to Mary. Soon after the reestablishment of Christianity in the city of Jerusalem, they created a church called the Nea, dedicated to Our Lady. St. Mary Major was created in the fourth or fifth century, I can't remember the exact date now, I think the fifth century in Rome. The Paris Church of Notre Dame is celebrating 850 years this year. In Canada, we have, of course, the 350th anniversary of the Diocese of Quebec, and its cathedral there is called Notre Dame, as is the Cathedral Church in Ottawa. If you haven't had a chance to visit the Cathedral of Ottawa, I urge you to do that next time you come to visit your parliamentarian or to see what your tax dollars are doing. It's a beautiful church. One of the striking features of Notre Dame Cathedral in Ottawa is that the ceiling is covered with stars, stars of the heavens. And so is heaven. If you look up above the altar, the statue of our Lord in glory is there with Mary at his side and St. Joseph on the other side interceding. And so our cathedral church is a reflection of heaven. And just opposite the bishop's chair, there is an image of the cenacle in Jerusalem. And the Seneca has the same ceiling, the same configuration. In other words, in this church in which we honor Mary, God is present. And God intercedes and gives us, the, God blesses us with the gifts that Mary intercedes for us with her son. Last evening, Bob and the other speakers invited us to enter into an experience of God. The God who is faithful, the God who is loving, the God is, who is someone we struggle to understand, but is always with us. The God who is community. The God who invites us to join the family, the family of God. As sons and daughters of the Father, as brothers and sisters of Jesus, as spirit-filled individuals who witness to Christ in our world. Bob also spoke to us about the Jesus encounter with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, only one of whom is named Clopas. Who is the other disciple? We're not sure. Father Tom Rosica thinks that it may have been his wife. Could be. He has an icon at Newman Center that represents that. A husband and a wife, a couple, finding God in the midst of their struggles. But I think it could also be representing ourselves. You and I could represent ourselves as going with Clopas and speaking to Jesus about the struggles that we have in our own life our own discipleship, 
own attempt to understand God and God's ways. Some 40 hours before that encounter on the road to Emmaus, our Lord entrusted one of us and all of us to our Blessed Mother Mary, asking the beloved disciple to take her into his heart and into his home, and also entrusted asking Mary to take him and each one of us as her son, her children. So Mary is close to the children that her son entrusted to her at Calvary. And that's why we're happy to celebrate this Mass in her honor on this, the first Saturday of the month, a day which the church traditionally dedicates to Mary. Mary cares for us under various titles. Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Our Lady of the Snows, Our Lady Help of Christians. Pope Francis has been our chief promoter recently of another title of Mary, called Our Lady, the Undoer of Knots. When Jorge Mario Bergoglio was studying in Germany, he was stunned by a Bavarian painting of Holy Mary, Our Lady, the Untier of Knots. He took a copy of the painting back to Argentina, and he promoted this devotion to Mary there. This Marian devotion, rooted in Bavaria, bridges the pontificates of Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. In fact, Cardinal Bergoglio had an image of Our Lady, the Undoer of Knots, engraved into a chalice and presented it to Benedict XVI some years ago. The theology of Mary, the untying, untier of knots, dates from the second century, less than a hundred years after the deaths of the apostles. St. Irenaeus of Lyon, of Lyons, wrote, the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosened by the obedience of Mary. For what the Virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, this did the Virgin Mary set free through faith. This is one of the earliest descriptions of Mary as the new Eve. Eve standing beside Adam is the co-sinner with Adam. Mary standing next to her crucified son Jesus is the co-redeemer, the co-redemptrix. Mary assists Jesus in the mystery of salvation by his own will. Now Mary doesn't directly save or redeem us, but she consents and participates in the redemptive action of Christ. Her role is a relative one, whereas the role of Christ is the absolute one. What are the knots that Mary unties? They're the problems and the struggles that you face and for which you don't see any solution. They could be the knots of discord in your family, disrespect, violence, offense, strife in the home. Just look around our world and you can see all the problems, all the difficulties that are in need of a solution, knots that need to be untied. The knots are our sins, the sins of others, and the tragic effects of living in a fallen world. Separated couples, addiction, illness, abortion, depression, unemployment, fear, isolation, you name it. They are the knots of our lives. They're the knots that suffocate the soul. They beat us down. They can move us to be separated from God. The readings of this past week from the prophet Amos, although we didn't see very many of them because we celebrated Canada Day and St. Thomas, but if you go back and look at these readings this week, they tell us of a period when God's people had lost sight of his plan for their lives. The readings listed a catalog of knots, of sins, tying up the people of Israel, God's chosen ones. One might say that they are a listing of all the ways that we can offend against the Ten Commandments and all the other counsels of advice that God has given to us through Moses and the prophets, the faith community, so that we could stay right in our relationship with God and with one another. The people of God did not attend to God's teaching this legacy of Moses and the prophets spoke of God's love for his people and the ordinances that he gave them to guide them on the right path. The rebellion of the people of Israel became a bundle of knots. Here, too, the, repent the solution was repentance for the failures of the past 
and obedience to the commands of the Lord. Through the preaching of the prophets and the good observances introduced by faithful judges, priests, and kings, reforms took place, and the people of God were renewed. And at the end of the book of Amos, which is what we heard this morning, God promises an abundance of graces and blessings that will flow over his renewed people, over us, over you, and over me. The secret, of course, to being renewed is to begin the reform of our lives by undoing one knot of disobedience at a time until all the sinful practices are eradicated. Of course, this external renewal would only work until God established a new covenant written on the human heart, foretold by the prophet Ezekiel. And this would be fulfilled in Jesus and the new family of God to which we belong. In the gospel, Jesus uses examples from life in his time to challenge us to think differently about the works of religion, in this instance, about fasting and feasting. Fasting and feasting are opposites. There's a time for each. Fasting is to beg God's forgiveness and to ask for special favors or graces. We fast on Ash Wednesday on a Good Friday and we abstain from meat on the other Fridays of Lent and even all year long to recall the gift of his life that Jesus poured out for us on the cross, represented here behind me, this beautiful cross. The feast of God's presence means a change. You can't put a piece of unshrunken cloth on a garment, Jesus says, because when you wash it, the unshrunk cloth will tear things away. You need to begin again. You need to get a new suit, a new dress. Same thing with wine. You can't put new wine into old wineskins. Doesn't work very much for us because we put wine in bottles now, but in the wineskins, if you put fresh wine into old wineskins, it would burst them. The way of Jesus is a whole new way. A new suit, new wine, new feasting. I hope that's what you'll feel here at the end of this weekend. We need to be in touch with the teaching of Jesus and drink deeply from his teachings so that we may become what Pope Francis asks us to be, missionary disciples. Disciples who learn from Jesus every day in the scriptures, such as we've heard them today, in our prayers, in our reflections, in the rosary, the way of the cross. When we hear about these things and we become transformed, and we're called to go forth and to share the good news with other people. There are lots of knots in your life and in my life to be undone. Some are sins that we have been dealing with. Some are the experiences of our lives. Last evening when Haley was, Kaylee was speaking, I had a great sense of identification with her experience of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. There's one time I remember just before I took my final vows as a Jesuit priest, I was making a long retreat, 30 days, and I went to speak to my confessor and I brought up a hurt that was in my life. The teacher who had, I felt, mishandled me, mistreated me, and I bore a grudge against him for years. And my confessor said to me, you know, Terry, the only person that's hurting now is you. That teacher has long since forgotten that you were in his class. He probably doesn't even remember your name. Why are you holding on to that? Why not let it go? And so I did. And this teacher of mine was from the United States. I had studied at Fordham University for a number of years for my training. The next year, he came up to Toronto to give a talk. I went to see him. I welcomed him to Toronto, and I said, I'm happy to see you. And I shook his hand. And for me, that shaking of the hand was to say, I'm going to let go all that hurt. I'm going to begin anew. Each of us has those kinds of moments, those kinds of experiences where we need to begin to be healed, to be reconciled, to have the knot untied, the knot of the interior hurt, the knot of sin, the knot of not really knowing where to go, what to do. And so I ask you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to take your knots before the Lord. Ask Mary's help. Ask her to help you to bring the, the true situation of your soul, of your life, before our God. Trust her to be gentle with you, to be kind with you. Mary is the undoer of knots who was chosen by God to crush the evil one with her feet. 
I don't know if this statue has it, probably. Is there a question of the serpent? That's what she does. She undoes the sin that we have. Mary accompanies us as we share the good news that we've experienced with others. She is a star of the new evangelization. She's the woman of the Eucharist. She's the person of faith. She's the woman who will show us how to live in the spirit of Jesus, her son. So don't hesitate to ask her to pray for your needs, a summer job maybe, for good health, reconciliation to your family. She wants to help undo the knots of the sins and the struggles and the difficulties that dominate our lives. She wants us as sons and daughters of the King to receive the promise reserved for us from all eternity. She comes with motherly assurances of victory, of peace, of blessing and reconciliation. And so today, the first, Sunday of the mo first Saturday of the month of July, we pray that the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom we invoke under many titles, will intercede for us to untie the knots of sin in our lives so we may be purified and in this Eucharist draw ever closer to our loving and merciful God through our Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives himself as bread for our journey, food for our life, the strength of our souls. May God bless you all and help us all to journey with knots untied to the glory of God. Amen.